The question I get by far the most when talking about my customs is, how do I do my lining? Now, I don't consider myself to be the best wooden railway modeler around, but I feel like one thing I do pretty well is lining. It's a method I've been working on for years, and I felt like today would be a good day to talk about it. And I thought, what better customs to show my lining work than with the ones where you can actually see how I've honed this skill over the years. That being my collection of troublesome trucks. I figured these guys would be a good demonstration on lining work, since they're basically just a base coat of color and then black lining, with a few exceptions. So what I'll do is I'll tell you the story behind this rowdy bunch, and then go step by step into a guide on how I did their lining. When I was a kid, I never felt like I had a whole lot of good rolling stock. I was a kid of the 2000s, which meant I didn't have a ton of the more realistic, in quotes, rolling stock that was made years prior. The most realistic trucks I had were like one Fred Pelhay, one Rickety, and a vague number of Scruffies. I'll get into what that means in a minute. But I always wanted to recreate the long goods trains from the TV series. I specifically remember I really wanted to remake James's train from Troublesome Trucks, with its mix of stone and coal wagons. But I couldn't very well do that with things like the special edition Cookie Factory Cargo Pack. Although, I did end up getting a lot of use out of those trucks in particular. I finally took my fate into my own hands and started making my own Troublesome Trucks. I assessed what trucks I had, and which ones would be good for turning into real rolling stock. The first two were a chocolate rickety from the previously mentioned cookie cargo pack, and the wagon from the gold prospector cars. With a coat of black, the gold looks just like coal. After all these years, you can kind of see the chocolate peeking back through, but it's fine, who cares? It gives him character. These two trucks were actually the first customs I ever showed off in any capacity way back in the day in my Henry and the Kipper short. After how pleased I was with how the first two came out, I had to make more. I gathered as many weird, gimmicky trucks as I could find and began turning them into more realistic troublesome trucks. This batch of trucks were ones that I worked on on and off over a couple of years. Whenever I wanted to paint something that I knew wouldn't take a lot of time or thought, I'd make a truck or two. This one has seen a lot of love over the years. To my point of always wanting more regular trucks, back when I was like five or six years old, I took a Sharpie to one of my old scruffies to turn it into a coal car. Needless to say, it was really bad. So then a few years later, I figured I'd fix it up. I wasn't the smartest back then, so I didn't know where to get paint, but what I did have was white out. <laughs> I whited out the stone and also the face for some reason. It just kept getting worse. After sitting around for a couple of years, I finally turned him back into a proper truck. These two were a fun story. In 2015, I ordered three Center Island Quarry trucks off eBay. I was so excited to finally have some good stone rolling stock. But when they arrived, the paint was dull, the wood was weirdly light, and the magnets were flat and weak. This was my first experience with wooden railway knockoffs, and I was not pleased. In a fit of teenage angst, I tore one of the trucks apart and tossed the other two out of sight. I feel like even at the time, I should have been tipped off by the fact that they were listed as the Dolder trucks. It was only a few years later when I was more confident in my painting chops that I realized that even though they may not have started out pretty, I could do better. The stories of most of these other trucks are pretty similar. This one was the 2006 Day Out With Thomas coal car. I covered up the lead paint with more paint so now no one can get hurt. And after that I glued on some medium ballast to give him some cargo. These two were made from two different trucks that had clear plastic boxes holding their cargo. One of them was the confetti car from Salty's Celebration Pack, and the other one was the bubblegum truck from the Troublesome Trucks and Sweets Pack. Why they approved these designs, I'll never know. At the time, I just cut off the plastic boxes and then sanded them down by hand. I then took some modeling stones, sprayed them black, and glued them on top. 
If I were to do them again, I would definitely use a belt sander to better smooth out the jagged edges from the plastic pieces. I'd also use smaller stones for the coal. These giant chunks of coal never really looked right, and they're very evident when one falls off. This one was some kind of coal wagon. Don't remember from what, don't remember from when. And I really don't have anything special to say about it. And then there's these three, which I just painted a few months ago. One of them was another gold truck. This one was the other of the pair of the sweets trucks. And this one was the formerly destroyed knockoff Dolder truck. Back when I first got it, I had angrily drilled a hole through the plastic rocks, and so I needed something to, you know, cover that up. The crates on top are molded ceramic cargo that I bought off eBay years ago to use as set dressing in my series. I never got around to painting them, until now when I figured it'd be a perfect cargo to put on this flat top truck. I used an airbrush to paint on the tan coat, and then hand painted on any other details where needed. Alright, now that you've seen all the trucks that I've made so far, now it's time to get into the actual painting process. First, of course, you want to give the truck its base color. Lately, I've been really fond of this grayish-green color that I mixed myself. It kind of reminds me of the coal trucks from Season 5. So the lining for all of my 7 plank trucks has been directly based off of the design of the Giggling Troublesome Truck Pack. I know that there are definitely other trucks that are more detailed out there, but this seemed like a good place to start, and for the sake of consistency, I stuck with it. The first thing I paint is the vertical bars on the front and back of the truck. I don't know why the original Troublesome Trucks aren't symmetrical with these front and back bars. I'll assume it's to draw more attention to the face. So to prep the lining, I take a piece of scotch tape and cut out two lengths that are the right length and width that I need. I place them onto the spot that needs the lining, and if you're doing a one-to-one -one recreation of something like a truck that already exists, it's not a bad idea to use a ruler and get the right proportions of the lining. Or just hold up the truck that you're basing it off of so you can see a one-to-one -one comparison. So you want to place the two pieces of tape close to each other, but with enough of a gap that you can see a line of negative space between them. If you're going for very fine lines, it can be difficult sometimes to see how thin the gap is between the two pieces of tape. So be sure to double check before you start painting. Oftentimes if you're brush painting, there will be tiny grooves in the base coat of paint left behind by the bristles of the brush. These grooves can let paint seep below the tape that you've put on and make your straight lines come out jagged. So what I do to prevent this is I use a clay tool, which is basically just a needle with a handle, and I press the tape into the base coat of paint. Use the tip of the needle and run back and forth along the inside edge of the tape, pressing it into the grooves. This has been my secret trick to getting good lining for all these years. And now it's back to painting. In the case of the troublesome trucks, I just use black for all the lining. For other rolling stock, I'll sometimes use a darker shade of the base color for the lining, to make it a little more discreet, but however you want to do it is totally up to your own preference. So now I paint between the lines of the tape. Be careful, because you can unknowingly go over the other side of the tape by mistake. I let the first pass dry, and then give it a second coat. Always give your lining at least two coats. If the paint is too thin, it can get ripped off the model when you take off the tape. This can also happen when you have too many layers of paint, and the paint inside the lines of the tape and on top of the tape can just solidify as one mass. So I'd say two to three coats of paint for lining is the sweet spot. Once it's dry, carefully peel off the tape. Next, it's time to add the horizontal planks onto the trucks. For something like this, where you have a lot of evenly spaced out lining, I have a few recommendations. First, measure the surface with a ruler, and maybe do a little bit of math. If the truck is X centimeters tall, and you need to paint on seven planks, meaning seven lines, that means you need to make the lines Y centimeters apart. Quick side note from when I'm editing this, I had a mini panic attack because I was looking at my trucks and I was like, wait a minute, they all have seven lines. That would make them 
eight plank trucks, since there's a plank on either side of the last two lines. And I was like, ah, oh, crap, have I made 12 trucks incorrectly? But checking it over, I was like, okay, no. The bottom plank is the baseboard. It's the floor of the truck. So, crisis averted. <laughs> So it can be useful to mark the heights that you want the lining to be with a pencil and a ruler. I'll often measure the pieces of tape that I cut to make sure that they're the right width and they'll give me the right plank size. Now you can do plank lining one line at a time like I did with my earlier trucks, but now I've gotten into the habit of cutting all the pieces of tape at once and doing all of the planks in one go. Each way has its benefits. Doing it all at once definitely saves you some time, and with each piece of tape that you cut, you get a feel for cutting the right width. But doing it one plank at a time definitely helps you mitigate any mistakes you make along the way. Sometimes when you do it all at once, you can put the lining too close or too far apart, and you won't really know until you've painted on all the lines. It's up to you and what you're most comfortable with. Also, before you start painting, Cut a few pieces of tape that'll cover up the areas that you want the lining to stay away from. Once again, I use the needle to press the tape into the paint, and then paint on the lining. When you take off the tape, just be aware that a little bit of the tape may peel off some of the first lining that you made. It's a pretty low risk, but just be aware of that fact. After that lining is done, you can add on the supports in the center of the truck. These are pretty simple to make. They're just black rectangles that go over the other lining. So, tape, needle, paint. Same as usual. For making the solid edges, just cut some more tape and use it to close the gaps in the tape. Another side note, I forgot about these little uh, horizontal black rectangles, which are usually the last piece of detailing. So, uh, yeah, just you know, line those out with tape, paint them on, same as usual. But yeah. That's why in the next couple shots, the truck will technically be unfinished. Then, depending on what model you're painting, you can paint on some cargo, be it coal, stone, or whatever you want. In the case of this one that I've been painting throughout the video, I'll tape off the edges and then give the gold a few coats of black. And that's it for painting. For most of the trucks, I have given them faces. In some cases, like the old scruffy and rickety, the paper faces are specifically to cover up the holes left behind by the old faces. But in most cases, it's just to add a little more personality to them. This old one did have a face at one point, but that has since been lost. So that's how I made my troublesome trucks. There are definitely things I would improve with some of them, especially some of the older ones. I'm slightly less hesitant to scrap an old piece of rolling stock and revamp it into something new compared to remaking an engine in the same way. Trucks are generally a lot easier to make, and I've made so many all with the same design, so I don't really need that physical record of what they used to look like. That being said, all of these trucks could never perfectly be recreated because each of them has a unique paint color. I don't think any one of these is just a paint straight out of the bottle. But I'm still very happy with all of them, and I'm very proud how they show my growth. But because my greed for more rolling stock can never be satiated, I recently made a very wise purchase. That's right, I just got a whole dozen more trucks to paint. These beauties were made by the illustrious Riotron 12, if you haven't checked out Ryan's stuff, I highly recommend you do so. It's really top-notch. So yeah, looks like I've got my work cut out for me with these guys. But hey, I won't need to do much taping with them. They already got lining built in. And with that, that's all I've got to say about my troublesome trucks. But before we go, just a quick update. The next video will likely be my big custom collection video to show all of the engines and rolling stock that I've made over the years. I encourage anyone who sees it to comment on the video and tell me which ones you'd like to see new videos discussing. And then after that video, I think I'll start on one that a lot of people have been asking for for a good long while now. So I'll leave it at that, and I'll see you all in the next one.